All right, one of the big problems that the progressive movement attempted to deal with was the problem of corruption in politics. And, and the problem at the time was that politics was enormously corrupted by the presence of business, monopolies, trust, political machines, and, and tremendous amounts of cash. And this tremendous amount of money in politics was, was, was seen in, in all different levels of the political process. Um, if you take a look at this political cartoon right here, The Bosses of the Senate, one of the most famous political cartoons of this time, The Gilded Age, you see these big wealthy monopolists in the back of the room and the senators, the ones who are supposed to make the laws and represent the people are, are dwarfed by these huge monopolists. Even the, the sign in the back represents this kind of this perception that this is a Senate of the monopolist, by the monopolist, and for the monopolist. So there was this feeling that American politics was being dominated by business, by political machines. Here you got Standard Oil being depicted as this huge octopus that has its, its arms and everything, whether it be the workers or the White House or the Capitol. You know, Standard Oil is supreme. Another one, this one with Rockefeller, you've seen it earlier, with this idea of he has the government in the palm of his hands. So there was this feeling that something needed to be done, that these political machines dominating society, money, monopolies, big business, there had to be a better way. That this, we the people, democracy needed to be held accountable. Um, and you can take a look right here. You have this, this real simple political cartoon by a guy who you will probably see um, other work of his in the textbook, Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast's whole point was he was attacking the corruption in city politics. And the way city politics basically functioned at this time was almost every major American city, um, from New York to Chicago all the way down to St. Louis, there was a political machine that ran the city and ran the elections and the politics of that city. So in this cartoon, Thomas Nast is targeting one of the most famous guys, uh, a guy by the name of Boss Tweed. And there was this idea that, you know, more money, more problems. And these political machines, um, if you want to look at it just like in a real simple way, it was a political organization. It operated using political favors and corruption. You vote for me, we'll give you these kind of positions within politics. And this was all a part of this kind of process. Uh, it's about maintaining power at the expense of the well-being of, of the city. Tammany Hall was the most famous one. Tammany Hall in New York City uh, is the one that Boss, Boss Tweed ran. Uh, and Thomas Nass is one of these individuals who exposed this problem of political corruption. And he does so in a very uh, powerful way. He uses the power of images, political cartoons. Um, and he exposes this corruption of city politics in his... Uh, political cartoons that were published in newspapers all over the, the country. And the problem that he wanted to address was this, this presence of money and corruption in politics. And you get this. In the form of these political cartoons, like right here, you got this one, who stole the people's money? And they're all pointing at the different individual. This is the very famous... Boss Tweed, you can see his image. He's always depicted as really kind of big guy, bald beard, scruffy beard. Uh, and there was an anti-Tammany Hall and other political machines movement going across the country. Um, this idea is you expose this, the Tammany ring, right? Who stole the people's money? Well, they're all pointing their fingers at someone else. It's, it's not their fault. And you get this in these political cartoons and it, 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 it's very powerful because whether or not you could read whether or not you're an American or a, a fresh, you know, new generation immigrant, you can see 
the presence of Boss, Boss Tweed. You could see him in this political cartoon, one of my favorites. You got him being depicted as a vulture. And here he is, the vulture of Boss Tweed is, is picking off the bones of the city of New York. And you have things like the treasury, law, and different things, justice, being kind of stripped away, a vulture preying on the weak and the dead. Um, and this movement at reform really finds a, a big advocate in this man. Robert La Follette is one of the most important progressive reformers of this time. And Robert La Follette is a really interesting guy. And Robert La Follette had a real simple goal. He became an elected official in Wisconsin and he wanted to reform the government of his state, whether it be city government, state government, and eventually federal government. And the very simple process that he wanted to do is, let's get rid of these monopolies who are strangling the public. And his reforms gets this idea of the Wisconsin idea. Wisconsin idea that this basically Robert La Follette is going to be his, his main goal. This Wisconsin idea is this term we use to describe his political reforms. But on the most basic level, the reform was about giving power back to the people. So, for example, one of the reforms he's going to advocate is the direct primary. <laughs> So people should elect who runs for election. It shouldn't be decided amongst some elite party bosses. It shouldn't be some backroom deal. The voters should go and they should vote and they decide who is the candidate that's going to represent them. And I'm going to give you an example of this in just a moment. Another reform that was a part of this Wisconsin idea um, actually started out in Wisconsin in 1903. And that is basically the initiative. And this one is real simple, too, this idea that people have the power. Citizens can introduce laws. Citizens can go through the process of getting enough signatures and ultimately putting a law on the ballot. Another kind of part of this Wisconsin idea are things like the recall and the referendum. The recall. Citizens can remove corrupt politicians. If there is a politician that was somehow not fulfilling their obligations, their duties in office, the voters can remove them through what is called a recall. In a referendum, citizens can vote on laws. They can go and they ultimately decide whether or not certain laws are going to be passed or not. And so all these different reforms are established, uh, many of them in Wisconsin by Robert La Follette, but they spread to other states as well. In fact, California um, basically has the power of the recall as well. A um, number of years ago, we had a governor by the name of Gray Davis. And Gray Davis was told to say goodbye. Goodbye. By the voters. No use during an election in which the voters voted to recall Gray Davis and put in power as governor the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Whether or not that was a good decision, I'll leave that up to you. Other examples of these laws in use today, uh, they're called different things, but the initiative. If you've ever been to a, a store and you've seen someone outside getting signatures from registered voters, very often they're trying to get a certain number of signatures by a certain date, and it varies depending upon the state. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get things on the ballot. And when you become 18 years old, you will get your ballot in the mail and there will be different propositions or initiatives that you get to vote on. They go from everything from tax increases or decreases to changes of laws, funding for different programs. Um, and you can see, you know, you got these, they all have a number or a letter, 83, sex offenders, sexually violent predators, this is one. Um, some famous one over the last few years, the initiative, uh, Prop 8, Proposition 8. 
dealt with the issue of gay marriage. That was a very controversial one and important one that California faced. Prop 4. Now this sounds like a beautiful, wonderful idea. People have the power to, to put laws on the ballot and vote on them. But the problem is the proposition process is so confusing. There's so much money invested in it. And so very often the voters don't even know exactly what they're voting for. So a good example of this is Prop 4. Uh, you know, you look at these two ads, vote no on Prop 4, you protect teen safety, vote yes on Prop 4, you stop child predators. Um, both of those things sound great, but Prop 4 actually had to deal with the issue of abortion and whether or not minors had to get permission to get abortions. So very often the advertising is misleading and the voting public is confused. So, you know, these are new challenges of our democracy. Uh, some of them are real simple, but even then, it's not presented as simple as uh, you would think. So Prop 21 had to do with uh, increasing the tax on vehicle registration in California. Uh, and the idea would be that increase would go to help keep our state parks functioning. Uh, that one also was controversial. Um, one of the other reforms, you still see it, is the direct primary. And the direct primary originates also in Wisconsin. Instead of party bosses picking who the candidates are going to be, the voters do. So if you remember back in 2008, the Democrats didn't just one day say, here's our candidate, I hope you like America. There was a process. And there was a process in which you had different people running for the candidacy of the Democratic candidate. You had Barack Obama, you had Hillary Clinton, you had Jonathan Edwards, you had Bill Richardson, you had all these different people, Joe Biden, and they ran and eventually the voters of the Democratic Party picked Obama. Same thing happened with the Republicans when they were picking their candidate. You know, you had Herman Cain, you had, of course, Mitt Romney, Newt Gingrich, Michelle Bachman, Rick Santorum, and then ultimately, the winner of that thing, that, that, that process, becomes the candidate for that party. Previously, voters had no say. The party bosses picked who was going to be the candidate. So this is all part of this democratization of politics, meaning the people have greater control over who is getting elected, what laws are being passed, and it avoids this kind of, in theory, this corruption that was going on. Another important law passed is they actually amend the Constitution in 1913. In 1913, the 17th Amendment is passed, which provides for the direct election of senators. And basically in California, in 2012, we have two senators, as does every state, and here are our two senators. But before the 17th Amendment, people did not vote directly for their senators. The 17th Amendment changes that. Now voters vote for who's going to represent them in the Senate. And in California, these are our two representatives. Big idea. Circle it in your notes. Put a little happy face, a little star, a little thumbs up. Is the initiative, the referendum, the recall, the direct primary, the 17th Amendment, all of them were reforms in politics as a way to democratize, democratize voting, give people more power within the process. It's not perfect, a lot of money. I mean, today, you know, I would argue back in the day they had bribes. You give money, you get these laws. Today we call them campaign contributions. So there's still a lot of money in politics, whether it be corporations or labor unions. Uh, big business and other special interest groups still have influence over politics. And one of the challenges is, how do we deal with that? It's something we haven't fixed. It's not like the progressive era is the, you know, woohoo, everything's perfect, and now we're going to be America 100% great. It's not the case. Um, just to give you an idea, to like blow your mind, in 2008, we had a presidential election. Um, in 2008, $2.8 billion was spent on the election. So there's still a tremendous amount of money in politics. And, you know, the system, in, depending upon who you ask, has flaws uh, that still need to be fixed. Uh, moving on to a new kind of topic is, is this man. I told you earlier in lecture one that this man loved the kids. And what this man did is Lewis Hine took pictures. Guys got to say, trick a lot of kids. Guys got to say, trick a lot of kids.
And he loved the kids. Lewis Hine loved the kids. And, and, and really what he did is he took photos of children working, took pictures of child labor, and he exposed the conditions in which young children were being, uh, not forced, but, but in many ways forced because of desperation to work in really, really poor uh, situations and, and being exploited. And his photographs really kind of lead to a whole bunch of new laws being passed that are going to regulate child labor. Um, not all of these are Lewis Hines photos, but, but many of them are. Um, and you could just see just different examples of child labor in America at the turn of the century, in the early 20th century, late 19th century. A whole bunch of different kinds of jobs uh, working uh, in different capacities. So Lewis Hine is just one individual who was, you know, trying to deal with the issue of child labor, um, whether it be, you know, just sewing for long hours or various other uh, types of work. Um, but the end result was the same. You have these kids, you know, with these bright futures and these hopes and these dreams, and they go to the factory looking for money to help support their family. And when they come out, they have low wages, and no future. So there was efforts to reform that. Another example of a muckraker uh, was a guy by the name, name of uh, Jacob Rees. Jacob Rees wrote a book, How the Other Half Lives. And basically what he said is, in the How the Other Half Lives, there ain't no love in the heart of the city. <laughs> And basically, uh, Jacob Reese writes this book, How the Other Half Lives, and the whole point of the book was that he was this immigrant, he was a muckraker, and he exposed the terrible conditions of the tenements. This book comes out in 1890, it's still being published, and, and the message is, what's going on in these other Americans' homes? What was life like? And people were finding out that life was very different than what it was like for the wealthy or even the middle class. You know, living in these cramped, crowded tenements um, with horrible conditions and poor ventilation and disease and lack of health care, very common. Um, this was reality for so many people. And there began to be calls to fix this and to, to uh, reform American society as well. Um, one other person is um, Jane Addams. Jane Addams is unique. Uh, she starts something in Chicago. Uh, there's parks dedicated to her. There is uh, myself at the Jane Addams Memorial Park on my way to go see the Steelers lose to the Chicago Bears. It was a sad day. Um, and Jane Addams basically created a place in Chicago uh, that people could go and get help. Help, I need somebody. And this uh, reform that Jane Addams was involved in was the Settlement House Movement. Um, and her settlement house that she creates is the Hull House in Chicago. And the Hull House, Hull house in Chicago basically provides education, training, uh, daycare, uh, babysitting services, job skills, English classes, social activities for people of immigrant and poor Americans place where they can go and get some assistance. So she's one of these kind of progressive era reformers who is advocating on behalf of, of various groups of people. Um, but you also have just kind of more simple reforms that you would just not even think of as something that needed to be fixed, but needed to be. Um, and things like worker safety laws, welfare programs, uh, insurance for people who are injured on the jobs. This idea that here you got this guy right here, you know, he's missing an arm from working in the factory. Reforms in these areas. Uh, 
Um, and reformers are fighting for these different types of uh, reforms, such as worker safety laws, like I said. Um, by 1907, 30 states had outlawed child labor. Basic stuff, trash collection, street cleaning, the, the building of parks, things that we just kind of assume are standard uh, for cities are starting to be uh, the norm or at least advocated for. So, um, or even just, you know, if you get injured on the job, your employer is liable for this. Your, res your employer is responsible for injuries or death on the job. So those types of things are a part of this, this process as well. All of these are part of this progressive era uh, period. And of course, the big one is, you, you know, taking these monopolies and regulating them. To regulate. In fact, one of the big areas that, that many people felt needed regulation that was, was, was just kind of abusing its power more than any other, yeah, you have Rockefeller in the oil industry and Carnegie in the steel industry, but the railroads had these huge influence on politics and business. They were able to strangle you know, the farmers, for example, because they could charge whatever they want in some areas uh, for shipping. So one of the big guys that's going to step up to the plate when it comes to the regulation of the railroads is the guy you've already heard about, Robert LaFollette. Fighting Bob, as he was called. And Fighting Bob, you know, not only does he set up direct primary, you know, where people are voting for their candidate, but he sets up regulatory commissions to regulate the railroads in the state of Wisconsin and also on the national level. He uh, establishes some of the first campaign spending laws to restrict the amount of money that could be spent on campaigns. Um, and his whole goal behind this Wisconsin idea was to make the government more accountable to the people. And so you have this being a big part of the progressive era with people like Robert LaFollette. Um, and here he is giving one of his speeches from the back of this little, you know, wagon. And he was a real fiery speaker. But you also have people that just do something simple as uh, Ida Tarbell. Ida Tarbell uh, was a muckraker who wrote a book. And her book basically was one of the factors that contributed to Rockefeller being exposed and the government to go after him and to more vigorously regulate business practices in the oil industry. So you have that as a part of this um, progressive era as well. And of course, another part of the progressive era that really is, is uh, different then, then this whole regulating monopolies and child labors is the moralistic aspect to the progressive movement. And what that basically means is there were some members of the progressive movement who wanted to use the power of the government, the state, the federal and state government, to regulate individual behavior, uh, to deal with what they felt were moral problems. Um, and there was this idea, and this, once again, not... A unified movement there was a variety of different people who advocated for different things but there were people who want to regulate behavior so for example campaigns against gambling getting people to uh, stop gambling campaigns against amusement parks even um, there was this feeling that amusement parks which was a, a new um, amusement activity or leisure activity in America were, were immoral that that young people were going there and interacting and touching one another dance halls with the rise of music and the radio later on in the 20th century. So there was campaigns against a variety of different things. Many Americans, middle class Americans especially, felt that these places were immoral. That there was some sort of um, immoral activity that, that could take place. In 1910, you even get some people supporting the passing of what is known as the Mann Act. M-A-N-N. -N. And the Mann Act made it illegal to transport a woman across state line for immoral behavior. So for example, if you were taking a woman from New York to New Jersey, 
this would potentially, if your intention was a moral behavior, you could be arrested. Now, once again, how do you define what is immoral behavior? How do you how do you judge this? That's where it gets really tricky. So there were uh, progressives who were opposed to to certain things. Um, one of the big part of the progressive movements that a lot of people forget about is this one. And if you take a look at this image, this is you know, what's the problem here? What 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 is the the issue that they're dealing with? And if you take a look closely. You have this woman with her, her little dorky kid and the man walking into the saloon. Meanwhile, all these other gentlemen are going to work. And the, the issue that some progressives focused on was the issue of temperance. Temperance movement was a movement to get people to stop drinking. It ain't much fun since I quit drinking. In fact, there was a anti-saloon league, which was founded in 1895, and the anti-saloon league was against saloons. And the whole goal of it was to get individuals to stop drinking, and later on, they're going to switch to legal prohibition, to make alcohol illegal. And they will create, you know, posters and pamphlets and propaganda and political cartoons, and they actually try to get laws passed that will end alcohol consumption in the United States for people regardless of age. And they will be successful. In 1919, they will pass the 18th Amendment. Easy to remember. Think of 18, you know, the age where you feel like freedom is, is finally here for you. 18, you can do whatever you want. But the 18th Amendment, passed in 1919, will make alcohol consumption in the United States illegal. And we'll actually have a whole uh, unit and lesson on this, but a big part of why the 18th Amendment is able to get enough support to be passed is the beginning of World War I. There was this feeling that you know, alcohol is associated with you know, German culture and we were fighting the Germans. Not only that, but you know, alcohol is wasteful of food and, and we are at war. We need to save our food and it causes people to be lazy and poor and they're not productive. So eventually, you do get this, this amendment passed. Now, I do want to point something out that we're going to be talking about in class at um, great length. And that is like this idea of government morality and, and, and talking about what we should or should not do. And for those of you that do not know, New York did something that was quite controversial. Uh, they passed a law which basically banned the sale of certain size sodas in certain uh, businesses. And this was very controversial. Some people say, and the mayor of the New York is Mayor Bloomberg, that he's creating a nanny state. That somehow the government is like babying us and we're, we're losing our freedom of choice. Um, and, and many people were quite angry with this. And other people say, you know what? We need to do it because of obesity and all these other problems. So this is an example of people using the power of government to pass a law that has a kind of, not necessarily moral, but it, it's, it's legislating people's choices. Uh, and it claims to do so on behalf of the greater good. You know, and there's all sorts of political cartoons about this issue that, you know, you have the big sugary soda, you know, and this idea of our freedom and our liberty, you know, you should have the right to, to do this. Um, and you can see the portrayal of the Statue of Liberty, and she's a little bigger than she used to be. Um, the law, uh, you can look it up and take a look. There, there are certain criteria and certain size restrictions. Um, and where you can and cannot purchase these drinks. So still you can get big sodas at certain locations and other areas you can't. Um, and, and Mayor Bloomberg and the supporters of the law say, you know what, we have to do this because the size of the American public is getting bigger and also the size of the average drink is also getting bigger. Uh, and this is something I found, you know, the size of the average soda was seven ounces and, you know, now you have this 42 ounce soda. So dealing with that issue of, of just kind of obesity and things like that. So these are issues that, you know, this is not the progressive movement anymore, but this idea of what should the government regulate 
what shouldn't the government uh, regulate, we're still kind of dealing with those in various ways um, in American history and life today. Uh, here's another political cartoon kind of making fun of this issue and sending a message about this issue. Um, and you can interpret it the way you want. Now, one other one about this idea of kind of reform, government regulation, has to do with another problem that was in American society. And, and the problem was this. The nation's drugs and food were not regulated. And it was not uncommon to find uh, things in the nation's drugs. So, for example, here is Bayer, a pharmaceutical company, um, with one ingredient in it to treat coughs, coughs, heroin. And drugs in these highly addictive and dangerous drugs were all too common in the nation's food and drugs. And there was a concern amongst many that, that somehow that this, this was not good uh, because you have cocaine and toothache drops. There's the old story of Coca-Cola used to have traces of the coca plant in it, which is, is, is addictive. You have all of this kind of concern over the nation's well-being and these drug companies just did whatever they wanted and claimed whatever they kind of felt would be the best thing to claim to get the American public to buy their goods. And in 1906, you actually get a law passed, which has a tremendous impact on this issue. And that is the Pure Food and Drug Act. And the Pure Food and Drug Act does something real simple, and that is puts the government behind the idea of protecting the American public. Uh, you have a drug uh, ad from the past, you know, just kind of this happy, you know, Farrakhan and all these things that it, it, it will fix and solve. And now you have the ingredients, the side effects, the warnings, and the Pure Food and Drug Act passed in 1906 does a number of things. And this is the, creates the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, makes sure the products are labeled correctly, uh, that the food and drugs of our country are labeled correctly, and the nation. The idea there is they're going to ensure the safety of the nation's food and drugs. We're going to be, the, the F Pure Food and Drug Act is going to make sure, the FDA is going to make sure that the nation's food and drugs are in fact safe for the American people. And so this is another example of a progressive reform that takes place during 